Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Newsroom. I'm your host, Amakhal. But it is the 13th of October, and following are the stories that we'll be discussing in detail in the course of the show. We will begin with the situation as far as Afghanistan is concerned. We'll be talking about the recent sanctions that the United States has imposed on Afghanistan because of the fact that it is not doing the necessary for, to uh, impart education to the girls of the country. Uh, also, Taliban's responsibilities when it took power as uh, as uh, the, the governing state of uh, uh, Afghanistan had made many decisions, had talked about many things that they would be uh, putting into uh, implementation, but not much has been done since of the Afghan Taliban came into power, whether it be the trickling of terrorism into neighboring countries such as Pakistan from Afghanistan, whether it be uh, the rights of women and girls. Uh, the West expects a lot from Afghanistan and Afghanistan has not delivered. This is going to be our first story. Our second segment, ladies and gentlemen, is on uh, SICA, of course, the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia. The sixth summit uh, that is happening in Astana. Our Prime Minister addressed the sixth summit today. He talked about many important things that include climate change and, of course, the relationship with India and Afghanistan and many other important issues such as Palestine as well during the course of his speech. That and more is going to be part of our second story. Our third segment of today, ladies and gentlemen, concerns the Disaster Management Day. Uh, the International Disaster Management Day is being, uh, uh, should I say, celebrated or observed all across the world today. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, talked a lot about the impact of climate change, especially with respect to the floods in Pakistan. And he said that it is an eye-opener for the world. What needs to be done as far as mitigation of the effects of climate change are concerned? This is going to be our third segment. Our last segment, ladies and gentlemen, concerns uh, a combined keel laying and steel cutting ceremony of the first and second offshore patrol vessels that were being constructed for Pakistan Navy that was held at MS Demon Shipyard Galati in Romania. Of course, uh, this is another hallmark as far as Pakistan Navy is concerned, another step in the right direction. The Chief of the Naval Staff graced the occasion as the Chief Guest. This is going to be our last story. Let's begin with our first segment and that concerns Afghanistan, uh, peace in Afghanistan, the measures that the world wants pa Afghanistan to observe but Afghanistan has yet to deliver, whether it be to uh, take care of its terrorist elements inside of Afghanistan or the rights of girls and women. More in the following report. The Taliban marked more than a year in power as war ravaged Afghanistan's struggles with rising poverty, drought, malnutrition and fading hope among women that they will have a decisive role in the country's future. The U.S. announced new sanctions against the Taliban as punishment for their repressive treatment of women and girls in Afghanistan. Secretary of State Antony Blinken unveiled the new visa restriction policy for current or former members of Taliban while stating that Afghanistan remains the only country in the world where girls are sustained systemically barred from attending school beyond sixth grade with no return date in sight. Taliban government criticized new U.S. sanctions against some of its leaders as an impediment to development of ties between the two countries. After returning to power in August 2021 following the retreat of U.S.-led forces, interim Taliban government have barred girls from attending secondary school while women are allowed to attend university. A recent suicide bombing of a Kabul classroom killed and wounded dozens of students as they prepared for exams. Amid an intensified terror campaign by the Islamic State Khorasan Group and other terror proxies, international community is concerned about regional peace, which necessitate for Taliban government to fulfill their commitments in preventing Afghan soil from terror networks. Now to discuss more on that, we've been joined by Brigadier Nader Mir, retired defense analyst. Thank you very much, uh, Brigadier Mir, to have joined us. Sir, uh, when it concerns uh, the recent situation in Afghanistan, of course, before we get back uh, to uh, Brigadier Nader Mir, we will just give a little outlook on what has happened as far as Afghanistan is concerned. A year has happened uh, since the Afghan Taliban, more than a year in fact, since the Afghan Taliban uh, took uh, Afghanistan and became the new government uh, there. Nevertheless, a lot of countries, in, in fact most of the world, has not uh, recognized the Taliban government because uh, they say they have that the Taliban government has not imposed uh, the necessary rules and regulations, the laws that need to be implemented as far as the human rights situation is concerned, as far as tackling terrorism is concerned as far as the girls and the women in the country are concerned. Now, the United States has announced new sanctions against the Taliban as punishment 
for their repressive treatment of women and girls in Afghanistan. The Secretary of State Anthony Blinken unveiled a new visa restriction policy for the current and founding members of the Taliban. The sanctions also uh, targeted others that are involved in repressing women through restrictive policies as far as violence. He announced it at the International uh, Day of the Girl Child. Uh, I will quote what Anthony Blinken says. He said, as a grim example, for more than a year, Afghanistan remains the only country in the world where girls are systematically barred from attending school beyond the sixth grade with no uh, return in sight. This is a huge gap as far as education is concerned, as far as what the world expects of Afghanistan is concerned. This said, there are a lot of uh, other issues as well that plague Afghanistan, especially as far as curtailing the terrorist elements that are present within Afghanistan is concerned. We, we all have borne the brand, including Pakistan, that has seen the recent insurge of uh, uh, incidents uh, through Afghanistan from the Afghanistan border into Pakistan. Brigadier Nadir Mir joins us online. Thank you very much, Brigadier Mir, to have joined us. Sir, uh, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, how do you see these new US sanctions uh, that have been imposed uh, on the country? Do you feel Afghanistan is moving in the right direction? Afghanistan, uh, since the takeover by the Afghan Taliban of Kabul, has seen a lot of turbulence and they are still settling down. And uh, they are, while they are in power in Kabul and Afghanistan, but as you know, there has been an upsurge of other terrorist groups also. And uh, they have faced sanctions and faced uh, deprivation and food shortages and other issues also. So Pakistan has helped them out and we will, Afghanistan is our brotherly neighbor. We have tried and we will always support Afghanistan and the people of Afghanistan. And we have been doing that actively for the last 40 years. But as we said previously also, and as I've said, as the chairman of Pakistan National Reform Movement, all, you know, we cannot afford any kind of terrorism spilling into Pakistan from Afghanistan. Now, as far as the United States is concerned, it has concerns about the re-emergence of terrorist groups in Afghanistan or the stability of Afghanistan and all. And Pakistan also has concerns, and incidentally, China also has concerns and other states also. So actually, uh, Pakistan is already doing it and should do it even more, that we are trying to support Afghanistan on the one hand and also ensure that it becomes stable and the situation of Afghanistan uh, improves compared to what it is now. Brigadier Mir, when it comes to uh, the influx of terrorism f into Af Pakistan from Afghanistan, despite the fact that Pakistan has always stood by Afghanistan, why are there elements within Afghanistan that are trying to continue to create havoc inside our country, despite the fact that also we are uh, hosting millions of their refugees since decades? Pakistan has been supportive of Afghanistan from uh, its own infancy, that is from 1947. But for so the last 40 years, 50 years, since the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan 1979, and of course then the American, um, you know, takeover of Afghanistan after 9-11 and all that, there has been uh, Afghanistan which has had been war. And it, there is, it's not just a single entity. There are numerous factions, ethnic, social, political, uh, tribal groups, and um, militants also. And But the main issue is, as I said previously, and I repeat, it is geopolitical terrorism because the main cause of terrorism, which was initially, or militancy initially, was that the Afghans were fighting a foreign invader. Initially, it was the Soviets, and later it was the Americans and NATO. And though all those forces have left, so there should be no real reason. There's no, in principle, there's no reason for any kind of even militancy because. Today, Afghanistan is run by Afghans. It's not run by a foreign power. It's not, Kabul is not controlled or run by a foreign power. It's Afghans themselves. Of course, and Afghans have to solve their issues. And of course, Pakistan and other nations can support them. As far as this question is, why there is still terrorism and spilling into Pakistan, it is directed. And as you've seen recently, we are just experiencing it. Just see who is the main state actor acting against Pakistan. It is India, I have repeatedly said, and as chairman Pakistan National Reform Movement, I have said it repeatedly, that India is the enemy. Pakistan has no other enemy. Actually, Pakistan doesn't want enmity with anybody, and Pakistan has made overtures to India also for peace and for resolution of Kashmir. But the Indians, in their aggrandizement policy, in their, with their oversized geopolitical agenda and their ambitions to have hegemony in the whole region, they are not 
interested in peace. So but I can understand India that India is not interested in peace, but isn't Afghanistan no, Brigadier Saab? I can understand Brigadier Saab that uh, India is not interested in peace, but why isn't Afghanistan interested in peace? Because this is happening through the Afghan soil, isn't it? It is happening through Afghanistan, but Afghanistan should not be taken as one single entity. For example, right. the Afghan Taliban who are in power, they are mostly Pashtuns. There are Tajiks, mm. there are other ethnic communities, there are tribal groups, and there are, and, uh, and there are been fighting for 40, 50 years. This is what most of these people know. I mean, right. just see from 1970, a child who was born in 1970s, how old would he be today? And what do they know? They only know warfare. That's the only thing. They haven't learned education or economics. They've been fighting. And so if anyone gives them money or uses them as a proxy, so that is the reason you're saying, why do Afghans? Because they're out for hire. Some of them, not all, uh, the government in Afghanistan or the bulk of the Afghan people or the Afghans should be with, uh, 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 having appreciating that Pakistan is supportive of them for the last nearly half century. So this is the point. The question is, what is Pakistan to do about it? Pakistan mm -hmm. has to do two things about it. One, it has to support the Afghan government and Afghan people, but ensuring that no terrorism comes into Pakistan because we have been losing soldiers and young officers on a very regular basis for a lot of time. We have spent so much blood and there is no reason this war should go on on our western border. But on the other hand, as I said, and which is our policy of national reform movement, we have to be proactive. Just a defensive policy won't work out, whether it is Afghanistan or whether it's India who's uh, doing it. Hmm. All right. Uh, Brigadier Sahib, also let's talk about uh, the women's and the girls' rights and their right to education. Do you feel under the current sanctions that have been imposed by the United States, and there might be others that would follow, the, the Afghan Taliban will show some kind of leniency as far as the right to education for the Afghan girls is concerned? The right to education for Afghan girls, or uh, not only the right to education, but the right to live in the, uh, I mean, peacefully and honorably and um, later on uh, after education work also, and I'm, I, other human rights or women rights or girls' rights should be there for all over, uh, for all women all over the world, including, hmm. um, of course, Afghanistan, which we are discussing right now. And the Americans and the Western nations and others have imposed sanctions on them uh, for that reason, and because most of the world believes in this, um, almost all that women's rights it should be respected. And the Afghan government in power should, of course, have some leniency, some measure of leniency. This hmm. is one part. But the other part is that what uh, the Soviets tried earlier and later US NATO tried, you can't change culture, which is a, like say, a fan, conservative, traditional culture overnight. It has taken, you know, 79 was so many years back. And it, uh, see what year it is, 2022 now. And both the Soviets tried and then the Americans tried, the, you know, to mold them in their own shape, but they couldn't. So you've also to give this margin that while Afghan women and the girls have to be respected, their rights have to be ensured, it doesn't mean that it, has, it is at par with what is Western culture or what is culture in, I mean, women's rights in other places. I mean, women's rights in the Western world or some parts of the... Uh, but the Gideon women's women rights to education is, is, a, is a global right and our religion also gives a right for women to get educated. So it has nothing to do with uh, uh, the West or any other country. I think education is a basic right that also our uh, religion, that is Islam, enshrines. Of course, the right to education, and I go ahead, I have the right to work. Because you see, people who are educated also want to work, or they have been girls, which is their education, and earn their own livelihood through some decent means. That is also the right, not just education, but education, health, and economics, because all these things are linked. But the point I'm trying so to true. highlight is, that they should not be judged by Western standards. This is one. Hmm. And the second thing I tell our friends in the Western world or those who are putting sanction of Afghanistan, whereas we support the right of one women, but we also should support the right of Kashmiri women who are being raped all the time by Indian army. Hmm. All right. That is, that is a very good example that needs to be also taken uh, to the West and they need to understand that it, they should, uh, the sanctions that are imposing should not be unilateral but should be across the board to all those countries that are uh, perpetrating human rights abuses on different segments of their population, whether it be Afghanistan or whether it be India. Thank you very much, sir, to have joined us. I was Brigadier Nader Mead, defense analyst, joining us, talking to us about the latest sanctions that the United Nations, United States has imposed on Afghanistan as far as uh, uh, visa restrictions are concerned on uh, the Taliban. And of course, this is in light 
of the policy that the Afghan Taliban is uh, uh, putting forward as far as the right to education to girls and women is concerned. Let's come to our second segment, and that concerns Sika and, of course, our Prime Minister, who has addressed uh, uh, the sixth summit of uh, Sika today, talking about important issues such as climate change, Afghanistan, India, and Palestine. More in the following report. Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia Summit is taking place in Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan, and the leaders of a dozen member states are attending this multilateral platform. As the Intergovernmental Forum, which currently has 27 members stretching from doorstep of Europe through the Middle East and across Asia, gathers and marks its 30th anniversary, there's renewed conflict and challenges across Eurasia. While addressing the sixth summit of SICA, Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif has said Pakistan needs immediate help to rehabilitate its 33 million and climate refugees affected by the recent devastating rains and floods. Highlighting the plight of Kashmiris, Premier Shahbaz Sharif urged other countries to take notice of India's bullet over ballot policy as it blatantly quashed United Nations Security Council's resolution on holding a plebiscite in Kashmir. Reaffirming Pakistan's commitment to seek a process and concept of common, comprehensive, cooperative and sustainable security in Asia, Prime Minister had bilateral meetings with various leaders and expressed desire to advance meaningful engagement. At the present moment, Eurasia certainly needs effective confidence-building measures and SICA can contribute as intra-regional platform and Pakistan will translate this opportunity, the intra-regional socio-economic cooperation. With such a massive gathering of nations across Asia, SICA has a vital role to play, especially in the regional peace and prosperity structures. Tamur Khan, who is a research associate at the ISSI, uh, joins us online. Tamur, thank you very much to have joined us. Tamur, when it comes to SICA and, of course, the countries that are part of it, do you feel that under the current uh, socio-economic, uh, geopolitical, geostrategic scenario, SICA uh, has more or less gained uh, momentum or more importance? Well, of course, because uh, as you are aware of the contemporary uh, geopolitical situation that is uh, prevailing around the world, uh, the world is more and more moving towards regionalism rather than globalism. And all the regional countries are now slowly and gradually huddling together and trying to, uh, you know, multilateral, uh, multilaterally find solutions for the existing problems and different quagmires that they are in, in the form of uh, regional connectivity and regional cohesion. And yes, I think uh, the recent SICA summit is a part of that change. All right. Tamur, uh, when it comes to uh, our Prime Minister's address at the Sixth Summit of uh, SICA, the first issue, of course, that he talked about was climate change. And uh, citing the example of Pakistan, where one third of Pakistan is underwater and the millions of people that need the help from uh, the world over, irrespective of country, creed, uh, the whole world needs to come to as one to help pa Pakistan. Do you feel that uh, Pakistan, through this forum, that is SICA, has managed to gain momentum as far as the aid and help for the flood victims is concerned? Well, definitely, because, uh, you know, the uh, Prime Minister Shabash Sharif's address at the SICA summit uh, was exactly similar or uh, virtually same uh, as the one he delivered during the SCO summit last month, mm. and in which he also uh, highlighted all the priorities of his own country, first and foremost of which was the impacts of climate change that his country is going through. And I think the pledges and all the pleas and requests that he made to all the member countries of SICA, I think uh, Pakistan can expect uh, more uh, aid and rehabilitation, uh, you know, help coming from all the member countries as well. All right, Temur, uh, uh, he also talked about Afghanistan. He also talked about China-Pakistan economic corridor. Do you feel the countries that are part of SICA can evolve some kind of a strategy as far as Afghanistan is concerned before, before I come to the CPEC? Do you, because Afghanistan is going through a lot of changes and a lot of instability as well, whether it be uh, on the security front, whether it be on the humanitarian or economic front. Do you feel uh, these countries can help Pakistan, Afghanistan stabilize itself? Well, of course, because as you are aware that after August 15, 2021, the, after the uh, withdrawal of foreign troops from Afghanistan, Afghanistan's problems and Afghanistan's situation uh, was solely and uh, only left to the regional countries to bear and to take up the responsibility of managing the instability in the country by themselves. So, of course, uh, as far as the problems and the uh, conundrum of the Afghanistan is concerned, all the regional countries, they need to get together and they need to devise a strategy 
in order to you know collectively uh, address all the problems that are emanating from afghanistan be it the case of international terrorism be it the case of human rights violations or the narco and drug trafficking emanating from the country so it is the only it is the sole responsibility of all the regional countries be it the central asian countries be it pakistan iran and so on and so forth to come together and you know devise a strategy and a framework in order to facilitate the current uh, interim setup in afghanistan to manage all its problems and ensure good governance in the country because the peace and stability of this entire region and especially the uh, transit trade and the economic progress of this entire region uh, is dependent upon peace and stability and prosperity within afghanistan and unless and until uh, this situation in afghanistan is managed by all the regional countries i don't think so any projects for for instance bri or cpec for that matter will ever be successful that is so true and i mean whether it be cpec or whether it be other projects until the region is stabilized under the region until the region is peaceful we cannot move forward and that is what our prime minister also said that the pakistan's first priority is to revive a rapid and equitable economic growth but for that stability in the region is imperative when you uh, look at the different issues that pertain uh, to the region of which uh, the sika is formed the 27 countries do you feel that uh, these countries can look in words and try to find some kind of solution? solution for the issues that pertain to the region well if you look at it pragmatically i don't think so the regional countries have any other way out but uh, you know get together and devise a strategy in which to address all these issues uh, collectively because the first and foremost issue that is being faced by this entire region and particularly the sika region uh, sika member states is of security and stability and peace and uh, you know all these countries are either uh, facing the menace of terrorism or separatism or uh, you know uh, different kinds of other uh, menaces are being faced by all these regional countries which are mm. generally of a similar nature and uh, it is pertinent for them to get together put aside their differences and resolve their issues amicably through political dialogue and conversation as it is the mandate of the sika as well so uh, you know all these countries like the central asian countries the middle eastern countries and south and southeast asian countries they need to put their differences aside and look at the contemporary situation pragmatically and devise a collective strategy in order to resolve all their issues uh, collectively that is the only way for them because if they don't do that the external powers or the detractors of peace and prosperity and stability will keep on capitalizing on the vulnerabilities that exist within this region and uh, you know always try to create more chaos and stability instability sorry all right temur uh, india was also highlighted as part of uh, the speech of our premier and he talked about uh, indian illegally occupied jammu and kashmir he talked about the resolutions but he also talked about dialogue with india and he said that to, uh, pakistan was willing and ready to engage with india for regional peace uh, pakistan is this is not the first time that pakistan has said it is ready for dialogue uh, with india but do you feel that the timing is right for uh, uh, countries to put exert pressure on india to maybe uh, do things right of course because uh, i believe that the timing is very right because uh, what is going on in europe at the moment particularly with regards to the russian invasion of ukraine uh, countries like india who have an who have expansionist designs and who are also amassing considerable power be in be it in terms of economy or politics or military militarily Uh, they are also getting encouraged that they can also make such transgressions and change international borders unilaterally or disregard uh, different international covenants uh, for example with regards to uh, the issue of jammu and kashmir so see, it is very important for all the member countries of sika and other different organizations of which india and pakistan are members of to put pressure on india to try to resolve the issue of jammu and kashmir which is also the oldest pending dispute on the unsc agenda with a political consensus and through dialogue and political and amicably uh, without any uh, you know military or armed confrontation with pakistan and we also have to keep in mind that uh, like uh, since in the russia ukraine war russia also resorted to delivering benign or uh, implicit nuclear threats uh, uh, in its armed uh, invasion of ukraine and i and as you are aware that india and pakistan are also two armed nuclear countries and if such burning issues like uh, jammu and kashmir which are also termed as a nuclear flashpoint if they are not resolved through dialogue then you know this nuclear flashpoint or you know as it is called the nuclear taboo in international relations jargon might just be manifested you know it, you know that is that is so true that is
Yes, so true. Temur finally, another flash point is Palestine that was also highlighted by our Premier. He talked about other issues, but he highlighted Palestine as well. That there needs to be some kind of political solution to the conflicts in Middle East, and that includes Palestine. When he also reaffirms Pakistan's commitment to the SICA process in the concept of sustainable security in Asia, don't you feel other countries can do the same? Of course they should, because you see, uh, unless and until countries like uh, the issues like Palestine and Kashmir are not resolved, the rest of the world will never be able to empathize with all the other uh, uh, areas uh, areas where trouble is currently brewing up, such as Ukraine. Uh, people of uh, Ukraine and especially Western powers, they are, uh, you know, very dissatisfied with the response being given to that issue uh, by the rest of the world. But they should also realize that the ignorance that their own contemporary issues, uh, you know, have received from the Western powers, they are also, you know, reciprocating the same sentiments when it comes to their, uh, when it comes to the Western issues as well. So they have to empathize with the contemporary issues of other uh, countries in order to receive similar or reciprocate the similar sentiments towards their uh, issues as well. So with regards to Palestine and with Kashmir, I think our Prime Minister raised these issues uh, very timely and in very strong, uh, uh, in a very strong manner. And I think other Sikha country members should also do the same because unless they need to follow suit. I think that's very important. I think Pakistan has set the right example with the topics that it uh, put forward uh, through the speech of our Premier Shehbaz Shahib. Thank you very much, Temur Khan, Research Associate, ISSI, to talk about Sika, Pakistan's uh, involvement in Sika, and the way our Premier highlighted important issues that plague the region, including Pakistan, climate change, of course, on the forefront, but security issues as well. Let's come to our third issue uh, and third segment, third story, and that concerns the International Disaster Management Day. This day was started in 1989 by the United Nations, and it continues every day of the 13th of October, we uh, observe the International Disaster Management Day. Why it is important this year? Because we in Pakistan have borne the brunt of disaster uh, through uh, effects of climate change. And that is what Antonio Guterres also said in his speech uh, that he uh, put forward on the 13th. That is today. He talked about climate disasters that are hurting countries and economies like never before. He talked about Pakistan. He said, I saw firsthand the devastation unleashed by the recent floods in Pakistan. These increasing calamities cost lives and hundreds of billions of dollars in loss and damage. Sidra Riyas, uh, GM Communications, uh, PPAF joins us online. Sidra, thank you very much to have joined us. Sidra, the International, Disc, uh, International uh, 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 Disaster Risk Reduction Day. How important is it now that we are bearing the brunt of a huge disaster such as floods. Uh, yes, thank you so much for having me on the show on this, uh, you know, to discuss very, very important uh, International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction. And like you just mentioned that, um, you know, Pakistan has currently uh, been facing the very unfortunate uh, floods, uh, worst in the, yeah, you know, uh, in the recent history. Um, uh, with uh, almost you know 33 million people replaced and uh, you know 2 million houses damaged so you know the the catastrophe is huge and you know now is the time to actually reflect and take stock of the situation and really see i mean yes it's a climate induced um, uh, situation it's climate pakistan is you know uh, one of the eight most vulnerable uh, countries in the world uh, most prone to disasters but at the same time it's really uh, time to think that you know what do we do and you know how do we be prepared for the future disasters to make sure that um, you know our Exposure, the local communities, especially the rural communities, because you know the most impact of the floods has been in uh, the you know poorest, uh, poorest rural mm. districts. So you Agreed. know what do we do to make those communities prepared? What do we do to actually reduce uh, uh, you know the disasters in those? But you know that that that, that 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 puts the responsibility on those countries that are in fact directly uh, the uh, the source or the reason for effects of climate change such as floods. Now, when we talk of uh, disaster management, uh, something that Antonio Guterres said, and I'd like to uh, discuss that with you, he said three times more people are displaced by climate disasters than war. He said half of humanity is already in the danger zone. Is the world realizing? So, uh, uh, yes, of course. And, you know, uh, uh, who, who's, who better to understand that than us uh, currently with the situation that's um, ongoing? And uh, to talk of uh, uh, the current uh, uh, um, situation, like I said, 33 million people have been impacted. And, you know, it's just not the people impacted. It's those communities. It's their livelihoods. It's their lives. You know, uh, their lives are at standstill. And, you know, with the winters approaching, you know, we don't know when uh, people will, you know, go back to their houses. They're still, uh, I mean, 
mean, the water has gone, gone down in a lot of places, but still at some places, the water is still, you know, standing. So, you know, of course, and with the economy, uh, you know, a very conservative figure indicates that, you know, almost uh, $40 billion worth of loss, uh, you know, has been uh, we faced because of these uh, And it could even so increase in the coming really days or weeks once we understand the exact yeah, estimate yes. of damage that has happened. Uh, you know, exactly. uh, 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 yes, sorry, Sidra, sorry to cut you short, but Antonio Guterres says as a, uh, as a, what we the, the United Nations needs to do, he says he is calling for a universal early warning coverage in the next five years, early warning systems and the ability to act on them. Uh, is it an easy yeah. task to uh, implement? So uh, definitely, it's a very difficult task. First of all, uh, Pakistan needs to have lots of resources because, you know, climate resilient infrastructure, having those early warning systems in place, it's quite expensive, right? So definitely, we'll mm. be needing support of the developed countries because, of course, it's a climate-induced disaster and its responsibility falls on those countries. But, you know, if I just talk about uh, Pakistan Poverty Alleviation Fund, we have this, uh, you know, uh, disaster risk reduction uh, programs. Uh, we have BRDCC, we have LASA program. And I'll just give you an example. So in uh, Dera Ismail Khan, in fact, my teams were just there, uh, you know, last uh, evening, and there are two villages: village Kera and Villa uh, village uh, Gara Band. So over there, you know, we've to to prepare for the communities for disasters. We've done various sessions, and not just that, we've built, uh, you know, the, these stone uh, uh, protection walls and. You know, when our teams when their water is still standing outside the villages, but water uh, didn't come in, their, their villages weren't submerged. So these two villages are a classic example of how, I mean, yes, it is difficult. Uh, and, you know, uh, PPF has so far, I think the number is 150 uh, in KP, the number of flood protection walls that we've, uh, you know, erected. And, you know, this actually has saved... You know, those people, they were so happy. They said that, you know, the, these floods were way, way worse than 2015. But back in, back in 2015, the, you know, destruction was, you know, great. But now, they, you know, it's... Uh, their lives have been saved, their livelihoods have been saved. So, yes, of course, and, and talking about the early warning systems. So, you know, mm -hmm. when our teams were, uh, because uh, Pakistan Poverty Alleviation Fund is currently um, implementing uh, a relief package worth 250 million in all four districts of Pakistan. So, of course, we were in the field doing assessments, talking to people. And, you know, for example, in Punjab, in Rajanpur, in, you know, uh, uh, you know certain areas in Sindh, even in D.I. Khan, people actually said that, you know, the, these early warning systems that are already in place, they really did work. And people were... I mean, of course, there, there's been loss, loss, lot, uh, loss to houses, loss to their infrastructure, but they were able to save their lives, right? So, of course, we know that these systems do work. And like you said, Antonio uh, Guterres has said today in his report, quoting Pakistan specifically and saying that in the next five years, you know, developed countries need, need to take responsibilities and we really need to make sure that to save more lives, to scale up. And because, exactly. uh, uh, Antonio Guterres that, said I think that, that, that is, that is of primordial time. importance. And I think not only should the world realize that whatever it has done as far as our mission is concerned is uh, uh, reaping uh, into disasters such as what uh, Pakistan is currently facing uh, with the with the disaster that we haven't seen in decades. Let's hope that uh, the world realizes that it takes the necessary uh, measures. Uh, COP27 is just around the corner in the beginning of November. Let's yeah. hope, as Antonio Guterres says, that the uh, necessary mechanisms will be put into place and the necessary pledges and actions will be taken during COP27 and even before that. And I hope that the world also comes as one as far as helping Pakistan in this hour of need is concerned because the United Nations also sees major gaps between pledges and the flood relief aid. Thank you very much, Sidra, to have joined us, GM Communications, uh, Pakistan Poverty Alleviation Fund, to have joined us and to have talked to us about how their organization is also working to alleviate the suffering of the people who have uh, uh, been come under these floods in Pakistan, these floods that have impacted millions and millions of people and livestock and lands and infrastructure and whatnot, and then the diseases uh, that are so prevalent amongst those people who have been affected by the floods. We hope for an early resolution. We hope that the world comes as one and realizes what Pakistan is going through for no fault of its own. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let's come to uh, Pakistan uh, Navy and the combined keel laying and steel cutting operation uh, ceremony of the first and second offshore patrol vessels, otherwise known as the OPV-2, uh, being constructed for Pakistan Navy. That was held as at MS Damon Shipyard in Galati in Romania. Chief of the Naval Staff Admiral Mohammad Amjad Khan Niazi did grace the occasion as the chief guest 
and of course uh, the, uh, the first batch of OPVs, uh, which is of course PNS Yarmouk and PNS Tabuk, uh, had a very satisfactory performance. And now, of course, the second batch of OPVs uh, contract was conducted with the MS Demon Shipyard Romania. To talk about that, we've been joined by Rear Admiral Retired Salim Makhtar Sahib, he's a senior analyst. Sir, thank you very much to have joined us. First of all, sir, congratulations on the, the second uh, contract uh, that uh, you have signed with Romania. How do you see, what is the role of OPVs, first of all, for all those who don't understand? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, these are the platform, the uh, offshore petrol vessels, as they are called. Their purpose is basically it uh, is a multi-purpose platform which is equipped with the electronic warfare, anti-ship, anti-air, uh, uh, weapons and sensors. It has a self-protection and uh, the terminal defense system built into it. And uh, the purpose is actually uh, it provides the uh, what you call it is a multi force multiplier, you can say, uh, in enhancing the uh, uh, capabilities of the Pakistan Navy in safeguarding the maritime frontiers of our country. And it also provides flexibility, and this is very important to note, that it provides flexibility in conducting uh, the uh, independent regional maritime, maritime support plan, which is an initiative of the Pakistan Navy to ensure safe and secure environment at sea. So. It is very important to note that there are two other plans in which the Navy has been participating, rather commanding it in this region. We must know that this uh, North Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean region are, uh, are is a place which is very busy place where the regional and the extra regional forces are present. They are safeguarding their own interests here. And Pakistan Navy ensures that this uh, environment uh, is safe and secure for maritime activities. And it's not an easy task, really. You need a lot of platform. That means that you have to be at sea round the clock, 365 days a year. And that's not uh, easy. So that you have to have assets to uh, conduct this sort of uh, plan. And the induction of these OPVs will go a long way in enhancing the PN capabilities to, to perform its task uh, effectively. Sir, uh, these vessels you were talking about, these OPVs, uh, uh, how important are they? Are You've given us a little outlay of uh, their importance in the current maritime security uh, mechanism that Pakistan has applied with the different uh, uh, risks that uh, Pakistan might have on the maritime front or uh, the threats that come specially from India. Where we know the, how Pakistan Navy has thwarted certain attempts in the recent past as well. Uh, how important is the role of OPVs in all of that? Because if I read well, they are, these vessels are equipped with state-of-the-art electronic warfare, anti-ship, anti-air weapons, sensors, with self-protection and terminal defense systems. So, of course, uh, uh, this is a latest induction and of the late, with the latest technology. Will we be needing more of these OPVs in the years or in the months to come? Yes, uh, that's a very good question because uh, the Indian Ocean region and especially the North Arabian Sea, you know, there are so many challenges. It's not uh, the challenge against your own uh, enemy which you know what I'm referring to, hmm. but the challenges of maritime terrorism, piracy, human trafficking, drug trafficking, all these challenges are to be met to provide the safe and secure sea environment, which is necessary for trade to go on. So it means that you have to have platforms at sea all the time, as I mentioned earlier. So these OPVs, the offshore patrol vessels, are smaller in size than the bigger ships that we have. So keeping these platforms at sea is expensive. It takes time. It takes money. So it is very important to have platforms like OPVs to conduct these operations. So these are very handy. And then at the same time, you know, it's as I mentioned earlier, it's a multi-purpose platform with all sort of weapons and sensors fitted on it. So it will do the job of a bigger ship. The uh, range and other things, they come into their way. But to provide this uh, environment, these OPVs will be very effective. And in times to come, when you have the CPAC going at full swing, then again, you need uh, platforms like these which will provide the, uh, you know, uh, the seaward defense 
to exactly. Pakistan. I think that will be that will be extremely paramount in the in the months and the years to come, especially with CPEC that is going to concretize itself, and uh, we are going to see much more, uh, you know. Uh, projects coming up under the China Pakistan economic corridor so of course a lot of people a lot of countries are jealous because of that of, of the strong friendship that we have with China under the ambit of the China Pakistan economic corridor and they will try their at most best and there in comes the role of the Pakistan Navy and the role of the OPVs uh, when it comes to uh, the OPVs uh, uh, the, of course these vessels are uh, uh, brilliant I mean the way I read about them but uh, the personnel needs to be also properly trained to how to use and how to properly maneuver these vessels uh, where does this training happen? Does it happen in Romania or in some other countries or in Pakistan itself? Sorry, say again the last what you said was? that these. I was saying the personnel that maneuvers these uh, OPVs, are uh, they trained uh, in uh, within uh, Romania, in Pakistan uh, or in some other third country? No, no. It, the, these, uh, the, 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 people, uh, the uh, professional knowledge comes and uh, handy here and this the training is done is basically in the yard that is being manufactured, uh, where these big, uh, platforms are being uh, constructed. But what it is there is that the construction takes place over there, that some of the weapons and sensors may be, you know, they will be fitted in over here in Pakistan as well, added to it. And so it's very important that training is a very important aspect of the whole thing. We must know how to operate that. But our people and the ships that we have earlier, you know, Professionalism takes the top position and you have to train people, manpower to uh, sort of uh, man these ships. And we are fully capable of doing it ourselves, of course, with the help of the OEMs who are the manufacturer of these equipment and weapons and sensors. But uh, definitely uh, uh, with another platform at sea, it's not uh, difficult. All right. And also, sir, uh, how long does it take for an OPV to be fully constructed from, you know, uh, the beginning to the end? How long does it take for a country like Romania or this uh, this company that it, uh, that is Romanian MS Damon Shipyard to uh, actually deliver an OPV to Pakistan? Does it take a year, more than a year, around two years? Uh, it's about one year. Then there are different, uh, you know, construction, uh, you know, launching the platform is one thing. Actually, then carrying out the sea trials. And after the sea trials, you actually uh, then going to sea for uh, the operational workup. So these things, uh, they take time. Otherwise, it, it doesn't take more than a year or so to construct these uh, platforms. And we also have a lot of experience of uh, constructing ships in uh, Karachi shipyard. So, and as you know, that the cornerstone of our development strategy of Pakistan Navy is self-reliance and indigenous development. So in all these contracts, we have a built-in sort of thing of transfer of technology that we have uh, achieved already. And I'm sure in times to come, these platforms can be uh, constructed at Karachi shipyard and engineering works like we are doing in the case of uh, the uh, type 054 and other ships that uh, we are taking from Turkey or China. All right. And finally, sir, when it comes to uh, uh, the different contracts that Pakistan has signed, this is the second contract it has signed with uh, Romania, with this uh, uh, Damon shipyard as well. Do you feel in time to in times to come, Pakistan will itself, as you talked about the Kar Karachi shipyard that you construct on the Karachi shipyard as well, that Pakistan will be capable of constructing its own OPVs uh, in Pakistan? Will that time come soon, sir? Sorry, I just lost the contact here. Oh, sorry. Uh, can, can you hear? Can you, can you hear me? me, sir? Now? Yes, I can hear you now. All right, sir. I, I was just saying, sir. Question, will, where, it, uh, how, what do you foresee yeah. as far as Pakistan's capability to uh, construct OPVs on its own, in its on its soil, is concerned? Do you feel that could be a distant possibility? Yes, absolutely right. And uh, we are going to do that. We actually, I, as I mentioned earlier, we are already producing and constructing the uh, Chinese ships which were uh, manufactured in China. And the rest of the two of these, those class are being uh, constructed at Karachi Shipyard and Engineering Works. Same goes for uh, Type 054 that we are taking from Turkey. And again, we are, as I mentioned earlier, our development strategy dictates uh, towards self-reliance. And definitely... 
and we have capability with well the well, there seems to be a technical issue, but of course, uh, our guest, Rear Admiral Retired Salim Akhtar Saab, did explain to us the whole concept of OPVs, the whole concept of the importance of it. Uh, uh, Salim Akhtar Saab, thank you so very much to have joined us, to have given us a, a very detailed outlook on what the OPVs stand for, on their role in Pakistan's maritime defense, and of course, the fact that Pakistan will be in the future uh, uh, making their own OPVs, uh, constructing their own OPVs. They are already constructed constructing uh, Chinese vessels, but nevertheless, uh, more and more uh, advanced technologies will be coming to Pakistan, and Pakistan will be indigenous as far as the construction of OPVs in the near future is concerned. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to an end uh, of today's news, and we'll see you, inshallah, tomorrow with new story segments that pertain to us, you, and Pakistan. Kindly help the people who are in need. I always end my show with this text on double nine double nine. Send whatever you can through the philanthropists who are helping those in need or to the armed forces that are also helping the people in need or to the government agencies that are also there uh, for these 33 million plus people that uh, are in severe need and uh, dire needs of whatever we can provide them with. With that, we come to an end. We'll see you inshallah tomorrow. Allah Hafiz.